Ladies and gentlemen, let's right game into the video. Let us discuss what NVIDIA were showing off at GDC 2014. So they were showing off several pieces of information, or should I say several projects they've been working on. And some of them are somewhat surprising, others are extremely surprising. I'm going to be doing in-depth analysis on this over the next few days. But for now, I wanted to give you guys a brief overview um, while the dust settles. Plus, as well, it is UK and I am extremely tired. I have been working super late. And in addition, I've been uh, interviewing AMD and a few other bits and pieces. So today has been a pretty busy day. It's basically what it comes down to. Plus, as well, I've been pewing on Infamous Second Son, if I'm totally honest with you. Anyway. Um, where was I? Ah, yes. So, NVIDIA have actually announced the GeForce GTX Titan Z. Yeah, actually, the Z. Now, this is the first dual GPU Kepler. That's the GK110. So, this actually has the full GK110 cores, which is something we actually expected to see on the GTX 790. We don't know if that's coming. So, for those of you who are wondering, well, dude, you reported about the 790. Yeah, I don't know if this is if 790 is coming, or if we're only going to be seeing the Titan Z. But anyway, let's discuss the Titan Z for a moment. It has 5,760 CUDA cores and 12 gigabytes of GDDR5 memory. Well, what's the computing power on this? Well... It's actually fairly substantial. It's 8 teraflops. I'll repeat that one more time. 8 teraflops of computing power. Now, I'll admit the cost is absolutely crazy. It's like 3,000 US dollars because, well, it's basically double precision. So this thing isn't really just for gaming. Although they are marketing it for... Um, 5k resolution now this is more of a you know if you could afford it great but 99% of people won't be able to if you've got like high-end gaming most people will be served with like an R9 290 of course um, a GTX 780 or something equivalent you know whatever but this has been announced and I'm sure some people will buy it and they will use it either for work or for a plethora of different tasks it's absolutely crazy AMD, of course, are rumoured to be running the R9 295s, um, but there's not really any information on that yet. So, this is like one of those, it's cool, but it's not new architecture. And obviously, despite the fact that I was kind of having a nerdgasm over the 12 gigs of GDDR5 memory, remember the old problem with uh, dual GPUs. The, sh the frame buffer is basically halved because pretty much both of the GPUs, in other words, there's two CUDA cores in here, uh, not two CUDA cores, two GPUs, two GK110 cores. So each of those has to have its own six gigabytes of memory. So you've just got to remember that. But even so, it's absolutely ridiculous amounts of compute power, right? Anyway, let's move on. So NVIDIA have also announced another piece of technology known as NVLink. Um... And they've announced this, they've been working on it um, with, believe it or not, IBM. And they're saying that it's going to be incorporated in the next version of its power CPUs. So NVIDIA said that this is basically going to be able to share data between 5 and 12 times faster than what it can today. In other words, PCIe 3, yeah? And uh, this is going to eliminate the bottleneck and help... Um, help pave the way for basically supercomputers that are basically a hundred times faster than today's most powerful systems at least in theory um, and the GPU senior vice president at, uh, NVIDIA said uh, his name by the way is Brian Kehela in NVLink technology unlocks GPU full potential by dramatically improving data movement between CPU and GPU, minimizing the time the GPU has to wait for data to be processed. NVLink enables fast data exchange between the CPU and GPU, thereby improving data throughput, um, the computing systems, and becoming a key bottleneck for accelerated computers. Um, and basically, this is going to be an improvement for open power ecosystem. 
So what are the advantages over the traditional PCI Express 3, which of course most systems are using like PCI 3, PCI 2 right now? Well, basically speaking, although for graphics it's not too much of a big deal, the problem is the PCIe maximum speed, not including overheads by the way, it's around 16 gigabytes per second. That's assuming you're getting like a full PCIe connection over the 16 lane on a PCIe 3. Now, they've done multiple tests and I've spoken to, you know, numerous uh, technology partners and stuff, and they've all agreed that generally speaking, um, in gaming, there's very little difference, even on like the fastest GPUs now, between PCIe 2 and 3. So PCIe 2 has half the amount of memory bandwidth, just to clarify, so that means you've got 8 rather than 16, assuming you've got like, the full link, uh, full speed connection. But the problem mostly will come about when we're dealing with the next generation with like super high demands for compute. So in other words, GP, GPU stuff. Um, so the PCIe is slower than the CPU memory. Um, in other words, the DDR3, which is about, you know, the fastest memory could be about 60, 68 gigabytes, depending on the speed and what you've overclocked it to and, you know, timings and other bits and pieces. You know, you're going to be hitting, hitting you know, 50 to high 60s, really, uh, on average, of course. Um, so, obviously, that's considerably slow. You're looking four or five, whatever times. So, when you consider that, basically, NVLink is going to be more akin to what those basically more akin to the CPU memory. Now we do know of course DDR4 is going to be coming about at some point or another. Uh, GPU does have a small, uh, its own amount of memory of course. Um, it has you know the built-in frame buffer but obviously it's not as big as traditional you know your main system. For example you might have 16 gigabytes of uh, main system RAM and you might have I don't know, a 4 gigabyte graphics card, or you might have like 8 gigabytes of main system memory and a 2 gigabyte graphics card, or whatever. And so, obviously, there is that to take into account. And obviously, you've got this unified memory architecture uh, feature which is coming into, um, well, it's going to be happening soon, really. Um, and the idea here is that obviously, CPU and GPU could basically address the same memory architecture, and this allows this hybrid approach of computing. So, for example, if the CPU needs to process a piece of data and then farm it off to the GPU, it could do so without having to copy it. And more to the point, bandwidth isn't going to be really a problem. Um, and as I've discussed previously, CPU and GPU clocks uh, performance, the GPU is just that, it's just going crazy. I mean, as much as I like CPU technology, don't get me wrong, I enjoy it as much as everyone else, but like the thing that really excites me the most out of any computing part actually is GPU performance because it's just going off through the scale. And back in the day, and I don't mean to sound like, you know, a 50 year old farmer when I say that, but still, back in the day when a graphics card would just provide some textures and maybe a little bit of lighting. Um, this is before even, well, actually, it wouldn't even really provide the lighting. This is before even hardware TNL. All it would do is basically texture, and the, C and the CPU would do everything. Now, of course, more and more calculations are being shifted to the GPU. So now we're getting these situations where the GPU can do pretty much all of it. It handles the geometry, it handles the, the texturing, it handles the lighting in most cases, and it's even started to handle things such as physics and artificial intelligence. Obviously, some of this stuff still not implemented 100%, but the game engines are improving on it. And that's just something to think about. Anyway, there is a lot more on this that I'd like to discuss, but as I said, it's getting fairly late, unfortunately, and a lot of this is probably going to result me you know, actually looking really seriously at some white papers, which is generally what kind of happens on this. So, um, I did watch NVIDIA's whole conference, of course, and it was fairly interesting. I wasn't that interested about the whole motor car thing. They were talking about, basically, that they've got this technology now that is going to fit inside your car to make it the world's first smart car and eventually maybe even be able to drive itself. You know, it's kind of cool, but eh, I think the technology is a bit early right now and, you know, it's not really my thing. But the rest of it was pretty interesting. Unfortunately, 
Yep, you guessed it. Not really any announcements regarding Maxwell. So if any of you are wondering, well, dude, where's the coverage of Maxwell? Well, unfortunately, they didn't really announce it. In fact, they didn't really mention anything other than the fact it exists and woohoo. So, yeah. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. I'll see you soon. Take care, my friends. Bye for now.